Hello, everybody. Welcome. Come on in. Come on in. Thanks for coming to see the herd of harpsichords. And they are right in here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Keith Warmer, and I direct a early music group called La Follet Austin Baroque, about five to 20 musicians. And we perform music from the time of Handel, Bach, and Vivaldi. And we also use instruments that those composers would have used when they perform their music. And what that means in this case is that they would have used harpsichords instead of pianos because the piano at that time was still very primitive and not very reliable. So I'm going to give you an introduction to these three different instruments and uh, we'll find out some things about harpsichords. I'm going to take off my cowboy hat because it's not really polite to have cowboy hats on the inside. So let's come on over and have a look at, at this harpsichord here. And before we do, I want to talk about things that harpsichords all have in common, all these threes have in common. And what they have in common is that the way the harpsichord makes it sound is that the key comes up and plucks the string. That's opposed to a piano where a hammer comes up and strikes the string or an organ where the key goes down and wind goes through pipes. We're going to see the magic here. This is how the plucking happens. This thing is called a jack. And if you look real, real close here, you'll see that there's a little piece. Today, many builders use plastic, but back in the day, and in fact, this one uses a bird quill, Canadian goose in this case. And it comes up, engages the string, and plucks it, just like a guitar pick will pluck a string. And then when it comes down, this piece of felt dampens the string so it doesn't ring on forever. So a harpsichord has many of these jacks. Let me show you this one. This is a so-called jack rail. And beneath it is a bunch of jacks. And you can hear as the key comes up, there it is, this guy right here. The so-called plectrum comes up and plucks the string. Okay. Each, on this particular harpsichord, each note has two, one of two strings that can pluck. They have a slightly different sound. But the principle's the same, right? You need the jack row, you see, because if you hit the key too hard, the jacks will just come flying out, and that's very inconvenient. Here we go. All right, good. So all of these harps, of course, have that in common, that they have a jack, and the jack comes up and plucks the string. Now, what happens from there, based on the country, is very, very different. And not only does it reflect a different engineering technique, but it also reflects a different aesthetic in terms of the sound that they want. Now, we're going to start with the Italians, because the Italians were the first to monopolize the production of harpsichords in the 1500s. And from an engineering design standpoint, this is about as perfect an instrument as you can get. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the Italians took great care so that the strings speak at the physical length that is most natural to them. Uh, for example, uh, the string at C is a certain length, maybe about 11 inches. A C, uh, an octave below that, is twice that long. That's the geometrically correct length for the string. Also, they made the soundboard very thin and very pliant, usually out of cypress, but very, very strong. So that the combination of things results in a very clear, incisive sound that's very economical. The other thing that the harps, uh, that the Italians did, which is incredibly clever, I want you to take a look. See that there's an inside that's made just of wood, light wood. You see it here, light wood. And then there's a dark part here. That's actually two different pieces. This outer part is just a case. 
the inside part, this part here made of wood, actually can come out of the instrument. So if you're a Baroque Italian player and you want to go on a gig, um, you take the uh, playing part out of the case and it's nice and light. You can go to your gig just like a modern keyboard guy comes up and takes his uh, keyboard and goes to a gig. Uh, but if you want to come back to the home or your patron wants something very, very nice to display in his living room, you slide it back into the case and you have a great uh, combination of efficiency and elegance. Now let's just talk briefly about this case. It's, it's beautifully made. This harpsichord was made by the shop of Gerhard Klopp. And the, uh, the painting that's done here, this is very common uh, in Italian outer harpsichords to have a painting. This one is actually a copy. It's a copy of a, a painting by Domenico Vaccaro, and it, you can see it in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And it's a Greek myth, and it's the judgment of Midas. And in the myth, Apollo is in a musical contest with Pan, and Midas is making the unfortunate decision that Pan has won the contest. And I say unfortunate because you can see that Apollo is causing his ears to grow out like donkey ears. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful work uh, around from 1700, about when that's dated. Now let's hear the sound of this wonderful harpsichord. And to do that, I want to play music from one of the greatest uh, Italian harpsichord composers for the harpsichord, and that would be Domenico Scarlatti. Now it's a little ironic, even though Scarlatti wrote 555 sonatas, and most of them actually weren't written in Italy. They were written in Spain or Portugal um, because he got this wonderful gig teaching originally the princess uh, and then eventually the queen of Spain, Maria Barbara. And we know two things about Maria Barbara. One is that, of course, she was royalty and very, very powerful. And the other thing we know about her is she must have been one incredible harpsichord player because these these sonatas that he wrote are full of inventive ideas and they're almost all very, very difficult. So what I'd like to play for you now is his harpsichord sonata in G major, K146.
Domenico Scarlatti on an Italian harpsichord. Very incisive, very exciting. Now let's move to a different sound aesthetic entirely, and that is the sound aesthetic of a French harpsichord. And this is a harpsichord made in 1977 by the shop of William Dowd in Boston, and it is a reproduction of a harpsichord that Couperin had uh, and when he died, it was, it was a harpsichord that people can have plans for and study. And this is built uh, in, the, in the French tradition. The box is bigger, and what the French are going for is a deeper sound, a richer sound. They're not worried about mathematical precision. They're using uh, longer lengths for the treble. So it's, 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 it's a much more rich sound. Let me give you an idea here. <laughs> Maybe start the clock. Okay. Now the French harpsichords uh, started introducing the idea of two manuals. Very, very few two manual Italian instruments, uh, and uh, there are uh, two sets of strings. One set of strings for this manual, and one set of strings for this manual. And in fact, there's a third set of strings which speak an octave higher. So you don't hear it so much as a, the octave, you hear it as a timbre change. That's without, that's with. Okay. So I'd like to also show you that these instruments are also visually appealing. Of course, the Italians use the painting on the lid the French used painting on the soundboard, and this is one uh, executed by one of the greatest soundboard painters in the history of soundboard painting, and that is Sheridan German, uh, who pioneered the study of uh, traditional uh, soundboard painting when the harpsichord revival uh, came about. So this is some of her work from the 1970s. This is classic French. Big, beautiful flowers, elegantly arranged, Nothing crowded. And this is slightly unusual. Some birds here to add a little bit of visual interest. But you see uh, the, the, the flower is just exquisitely done. Everything is perfectly done. Now let's play some music. And since this is a copy of Couperin's harpsichord, let's play a little Couperin. And Couperin wrote about 230 pieces in various keys. And he would like to uh, often uh, depict a certain uh, person or a certain event or uh, a piece of equipment. And in this case, uh, he has a piece called Le Tic Toc Choc. And this is a, uh, a mechanical clock. Now, it occurred to me that I better, for our younger audiences, uh, explain what that is. Uh, before batteries and before electricities, you might wonder, how did, how did they have clocks? And indeed they did. And what they would do is they would have a spring. And when they would line the spring up, and the spring would gradually release energy. But so that it wouldn't release it all at once, there would be a little escape mechanism so that the uh, energy in the spring would be released and caught, and released and caught, and that would power the hands of the clock. And it would make this characteristic tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. And you can hear them like in grandfather clocks if you visit an antique shop today. So, that's what Couperin is evoking here. And I wanted to show you this because what he does is he has one hand on one keyboard and one hand on the other key keyboard. He calls it a, a, a crossing piece. A tick-tock shock. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, Couperin liked this device called a rondo. And what the rondo is is that he states a theme, and then he goes off and says something a little different for a while. And he comes back to the theme, and he goes off and says something else different. Couperin loved this form, and this is a very, very charming rondo. So here we go.
and that is quintessential French harpsichord music by Francois Couper. Now for the last harpsichord I want to show you, uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's a very versatile concert instrument, but it's a hybrid, a historical hybrid. Very interesting. Let's have a look. This is a blend of the Flemish harpsichords and the French aesthetic. You see, apart from the Italians, the other great building tradition in Europe was in Flanders, the Flemish. And they managed to come up with an instrument that had a little bit more depth and richness like, like the French, but still uh, kept the brightness and vibrancy and interest of tone of, of the Italians. And it was, it was sort, of a, sort of a compromise in terms of case depth, uh, in terms of string scaling, things like that. But anyway, the, the, the Flemish harpsichords were extremely popular. And they, they became like Stradivarius violins or BMWs today, just the name of a Flemish harpsichord, let's say Rooker's, would command a very, very high price. So the French makers found, somewhat to their chagrin, that their patrons would pay more for them to take a Flemish instrument, which wasn't to French taste, pull out the guts and put in th uh, more keys and more strings so that they could play the French music of the day, and they could charge more money than if they made it a, an instrument from scratch, like Blanchet made that instrument over there. Very frustrating, but it was very lucrative business, and they did it uh, with Flemish instruments, and sometimes things that they called Flemish instruments, but actually were not. So how did they do that? Well, this would be a, a Flemish case, uh, as it starts, uh, there would be uh, often two manuals, but oddly enough, you, you couldn't play them together at the same time. They were, um, uh, they were, they were quite independent. So, uh, and plus they had a shorter range. French music has a, requires a rather large range, even that Couperin piece. So what to do? Well, the first thing they did was they took all the keys out, and in making the new keys, they made them ever so slightly narrower. So you could stuff more keys in the available space. That's one reason I like it, because my hands are a little smaller, and this is wonderful for me. Uh, and, then, and then they were able to put in things like the uh, French coupling mechanism. Now that still didn't give them quite the number of keys that they needed, so they had one more innovation. If you come on over here and take a look, Here's, an, here, here's another innovation. See this odd little concoction here? Well, on a, on a Flemish, uh, Franco-Flemish instrument, what that is, is it's an extra key that's stuck in there. Um, here we're going, here's F, here's E, here's E flat, but this one is either a B or a B flat. Turns out any a B flat. Oh! So. People, people ask, doesn't it ever get confusing? And they say, well, if you stop thinking, yes, it is. But uh, actually, it's, it's more natural than you might think. And then this little, this little guy down here is also assignable. It can be anything from a, a G to an A to a B. Uh, and so it's assigned right now. So even though it looks like a B, it's sounding A, okay? But by those mechanisms, they created a sound of a Flemish harpsichord, um, which is quite bright. Um, but very compact, and it could play almost all of the French music. Now let's look at the soundboard painting again. Uh, let me first say uh, that, that in the tradition of most Flemish harpsichords, uh, they, they papered. You can, you can always find a painted lid, but more often they painted and they would put some neat saying. This particular one's in Latin. The way to decode this is, think of arbor as a tree. Tree is saying this quote. Uh, in life, I was silent. Vitae takui, mortui cano. In death, I sing. In life, I was silent, tree. And, but in death, Trees cut down, I sing. So, very 
pretty nice little sentiment. And here's another, uh, here's Sheridan German's uh, signature again. And this is done in the Flemish style. You see a lot more of these filigrees, that's very Flemish. All these vibrant but smaller um, flowers. You see fruit now. You see a shrimp. Very whimsical. All kinds of little fruits here. You see this uh, owl with this unfortunate mouse here. And look at the floret. It's 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 more vibrant. The fire, the uh, flowers are are smaller, and there, there's there's more energy as opposed to elegance in it. There's a bug, isn't there? So there's all kinds of neat things that you can find in a Flemish uh, key uh, soundboard painting, and this German is one of the greatest. Anyway, there we go. So finally, some music, uh, and I thought what we'd do is play some modern music, because indeed, although the harpsichord went away for a while because of the ascendancy of the piano, uh, it may have come back uh, in the 20th century, and quite a strong one. I mean, there's many, many pieces uh, written now for harpsichord and harpsichord and instruments. Uh, this particular, there, there are two pieces here I wanted to play for you, and they're by uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Willard Palmer. Uh, those of you who live in Houston might have known uh, Dr. Palmer. Uh, he edited, he was the chief editor for Alfred Editions. So those of you that study and use Alfred Editions, Dr. Palmer was the uh, principal editor for that. And he was uh, quite the character. Uh, in addition to Harp's Court, he, was, he loved the accordion, uh, which I, I can forgive him for that. But his Harp's Court had every bell and whistle you could possibly think of. It's, he called it Big Red. But anyway, he wrote two pieces that I think are just delightful, uh, and certainly for harpsichord. The first one, in fact, was dedicated to a very famous harpsichordist of the previous generation, which was Igor Tutnis. And this one's called Blues, and I, I think you'll see why. And then just a life one works quite well on a harpsichord, does it not? And then this other piece, and it's another genre that just happens to work really well on a harpsichord, is um, rag. Uh, Scott Joplin works great, but uh, Dr. Palmer wrote a rag for harpsichord, and I think it's just delightful. And um, in this case, I have to use that funny split sharp I told you about, so. I'll be coming down, bum, 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 bum. 
I, I did that now just so I could practice it and get my head right. So those of you that want to play harpsichord, don't forget rags. Anyway, that's a tour of my herd of harpsichords, as I like to call them. And I am delighted you were able to stop by today and see what these uh, harpsichords are all about and kind of get a background on them. Uh, I would like to thank very much Cam FA for the opportunity to put this program on for you. And also for my wife, who happens to be behind the camera that you're looking for. And that allows me to give this great presentation without a mask. Thank you, Martha. Again, thank you from the Herd of Harpsichords. <laughs>